So we've been learning how to look at monosaccharides as Fischer projections, where we're putting the carbon chain vertically and looking at the car chiral centers down the middle here. Um, and this is the straight chain form of, this is glucose. It turns out that the dominant form of most monosaccharides is actually cyclic. So they make a ring with themselves. And this is an illustration of how it does that. It's, it's kind of complicated, so let's, let's try to do this together. So here's carbon 1, and down here on carbon 5, this hydroxy group is going to be involved in making the ring. What we're going to end up with is a ring down here with an oxygen in it. So we're going to have a heterocyclic six-membered ring. So this oxygen here is going to be involved in that. So what I imagine is like this is a tree, and you chop it down, and it falls over like this. Timber, gosh. There's carbon-1 over on the right, and then this whole thing is going to curve around on itself because it's flexible, and so it's going to bend around. There's that hydroxyl group on carbon-5, nicely highlighted in the pink box. So this guy is going to move up. This, this whole thing can rotate. So this is just rotating around this single bond here, just twisting. So from here to here, we're just twisting around so that now this OH is up here, this group is up on top, and the hydrogen's on the bottom. You follow that? It just rotated. This hydroxyl group is then going to add to the carbon over here. So this bonds to the carbon, the hydrogen goes over to the oxygen. And so we get this um, reaction within itself. And from that we get two stereoisomers that are possible. Because this can happen, this carbon is not chiral. It's got a double bond with the oxygen, it's not chiral. But when it undergoes this reaction, it becomes chiral. And so this hydroxyl group that's formed can either be below the ring or above the ring. And whether it's above or below just depends on how the ring closes. And what happens is that the ring forms and then it opens up and it forms again. And it opens up and it forms and it just goes back and forth and back and forth. And so you get a mixture of these two isomers. This is called the alpha version and this is the beta version. And this is how I think of it. Because when we just run into so many of these pairs of things and you have to match them up the right way. Like dextro and levo. How do you remember? Well, it's levo is left. They both start with L. Dextro and right are the other one. So here we've got alpha and beta. So imagine the ocean. It's, it's a calm day on the ocean, apparently. Um, this guy, so the ocean here is this ring. And we're kind of looking, this is sticking out. We're kind of looking at an angled view. Think of it as being horizontal, where this is the part that's sticking out towards you. This OH group is below the level of the water. So it's under the water. Does that look at all like a fish? A little bit like a fish. The alpha one is where the hydroxyl group is below. Fish swim below the water. Here's the B version. There, now the waves are, well, doesn't work very well. Here it's above. The beta version is above. B for bird. Birds fly above. Okay. So the alpha version has that hydroxyl group on the bottom, and the beta version has the hydroxyl group on the top. Any questions? The cyclic forms will always be five or more carbons? 
Yeah. The uh, four carbon one, well, yeah. A four carbon won't form a ring. Because, see, one of the carbons does not end up in the ring, right? The, the sixth carbon is not in the ring. So we end up with a six-membered ring because oxygen participates. If we have five carbons, we get a five-membered ring. But if we had four carbons, it's going to be a square, and the, the hindrance is just too much. It just doesn't do that. I didn't get this in the slides. I wanted to, but it was just going to take too long. Um, on page 273, it gives the, um, the equilibrium. Actually, let's do this. And that. So the alpha D glucose, that's a cyclic form. That's an equilibrium with the open chain, which is in equilibrium with the beta form. And so it goes back and forth. Um, for glucose, if you look at it, 63% of it is in the beta form, 37% of it is in the alpha form, and less than 0.1% is actually found in the straight chain form. I'm sorry, that's actually supposed to be 0.1%. So that's, that's done a lot more neatly in your book. But It's convenient to look at the straight chain form. The Fisher projections are they're easy to look at, but that's actually very little of what's found in a glucose solution. 63% of it will be the beta form, and 37 will be the alpha. And because of this equilibrium, you can't really make a solution that's 100% beta D glucose because it will isomerize all by itself because that ring will open and then close again. So the ring opens and closes a lot. It's just never found in the straight chain um, for, for very much time, and that's why the percentage is so small. So we've got the two forms, the alpha and the beta, and the difference is that the hydroxyl group's on the opposite side of the ring. So here, the hydroxyl group's on the bottom, swimming under the water like a fish. This is the alpha form. Here, the hydroxyl group is up above, flying over like a bird. This carbon, which is the number one carbon, is called an anomeric carbon. Anomeric. And an anomer is... Um, well, you, you would have a pair of anomers. They're cyclic monosaccharides, and they differ only in the position of a substituent on that anomeric carbon. And that difference arises because this ring opens and closes and opens and closes, and you have rotation around this single bond. And so it just depends on how it's rotated at the time that it closes. You can get the two different forms. Now, this anomeric carbon is a hemiacetal carbon atom. Remember that, hemiacetals? Hemiacetal has a hydroxyl group and an ether group over here. So this is a hemiacetal, which is probably the main reason that we even told you about hemiacetals in organic chemistry, because they come in here. So this hemiacetal carbon is where we get the, the alpha and beta anomers. So glucose is obviously not the only one that does this. All of the aldoses that have five or more carbon atoms do a similar equilibrium thing, but they're going to have different percentages of the alpha, beta, and open chain forms than glucose does. Um, and I do not expect you to remember those percentages. I just want you to know that it is mostly present in the cyclic form and that the alpha and beta forms are probably not equal. You might think, well, it'll be 50-50, but 
they're, they're not. Generally, one form predominates over the other. Um, fructose and other ketoses that have enough carbon atoms will also form rings. So here is alpha-D-fructose. Fructose is a ketose, and so it's a ketone. And it is a six-membered ketone, six carbon, sorry, six carbon ketone. But because this um, hydroxyl group, I mean the carbonyl group, is on the second carbon instead of the first carbon, it ends up forming a five-membered ring. Ribose is a... Um, Ribose, I believe, is a five-membered aldose. It's a pentose, aldopentose. And this is carbon one is the anomeric carbon here. When we draw these guys, the oxygen is always towards the back, and so the anomeric carbon is the one just to the right of the oxygen. So here this is down, that's the alpha. There's the oxygen. This is the anomeric carbon. This one's not the anomeric carbon because it's not part of the ring. It's this guy right here. And so we look this hydroxy group's down, so that's alpha. Now, we mentioned these cyclic ethers way back when. Um, pyran and furan. This is a six-membered heterocyclic compound with one oxygen in the ring and furan has one oxygen, but it's five. And so, in general, a monosaccharide that forms a six-atom ring is called a pyranose. So any of the monosaccharides that form six-membered rings are called pyranoses because they resemble pyran. And the ones that form five-membered rings are called furanoses because they resemble these, the cyclic ether furan. So why do we have all these names for these groups? Because sometimes the reactions we're going to talk about apply to this one particular category of sugars. And instead of listing off all the sugars that it applies to, because, well, this applies to furanoses. So that's a five-membered ring sugar. Um, it's not necessarily an aldose or a ketose, a six or five or seven carbons or, or something. It's just how many are in the ring. So those are fur furanoses. They look like furan. Pyranoses or pyranoses look like pyran. Pyran, I don't know. Heard it both ways. Okay, which of the following, glucose, fructose, galactose, and ribose, has each of the following structural characteristics? There may be more than one correct answer for a given characteristic. Well, we kind of need... To know what those structures are, don't we? So, glucose. Um, I'm going to try to draw these in here. Ah, blue's probably not the best. So, Right, left, right, right. So that one's glucose. Is glucose a pentose? No. Is it a ketose? No. Will its cyclic form have a six-membered ring? What happens with the cyclic form is this guy right here comes around and hooks up over here. So five of the carbons, uh, one, two, three, four, five of the carbons and this oxygen end up in the ring. That's a six-membered ring. What's left outside the ring? How many carbons? One. So glucose fits category C only. Well, 
Let's look at fructose. So here we go. These guys all have CH2OH at the bottom. Fructose had the same orientation as glucose for these bottom three chiral carbons, but it wasn't an aldose, it was a ketose. So it's got the carbonyl group there and a CH2OH at the top. So that is the structure of fructose. Is it a pentose? No. Is it a ketose? Yes. So fructose falls in that category. In its cyclic form, does it have six atoms in the ring? Okay, let's change colors here for a minute. This, carb this hydroxyl group is going to go and hook up with the carbon here. This oxygen is going to become part of the group. Um, well, sorry, this one is. This oxygen. Back up, back up. This oxygen. So this hooks into this carbon. So then we've got one, two, three, four, and the oxygen makes five. That's what's going to make the ring. So that's not a six-membered ring. In its cyclic form, does it have two carbon atoms outside the ring? Yeah, it does. This guy and this guy. So fructose would be a correct answer to that one. Um, how about galactose? So the structure for galactose oops C H O one, two, three, four. Galactose right, left, left, right. Right, left, left, right. Is it a pentose? No, it's got six carbons, right? Is it a ketose? No, it's an aldose. In its cyclic form, is it going to make a six-membered ring? Yeah, it will. It's this bottom hydroxyl group that's going to come up to the carbon where the carbonyl group is. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Six-membered ring. So six-membered ring is also galactose. Does it have two carbons outside the ring? No, just the one. This question just involves a lot of thinking, doesn't it? Ribose. That's not what I meant to do. CH2OH. Ribose is like glucose, but it's missing one carbon. OH, OH, OH. So that's ribose. Is it a pentose? Yeah, we finally found our pentose. Is it a ketose? No. What happens when it forms its cyclic form? This hooks up with that carbon. One, two, three, four, five. Five-membered ring. And how many carbons are outside the ring? Just one. Wasn't that fun? I didn't like it either.